Hello everyone, welcome on a new episode of Robert Spotlight and Robert Spotlight Kusame Iwa. Kusame, welcome on the show. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, it's good to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you to accept the, the, the invitation. And um, would you be able to present yourself for people that don't know you? Okay. Um, my name is Kusame Amala. Um, I have been making generative artwork since December of last year, which I sell on um, FX Hash. And I am becoming slowly, reasonably successful at, at doing that. Perfect. Okay. Why, why do you say that you are... Um... Um, how do you say, what, what word did you use? Successful doing that? Um, becoming reasonably successful is what I said, yes. Um, well, I, I think that it's taken a while for me to be able to produce um, a quality of work which I feel happy with. And I, I think it's taken a while as well to learn about the platform um, and understand what work is likely to sell, what prices are right for me. Um, and recently I feel as, and also because I only started doing this in December. Um, so for the first few months, I was just trying out lots of different things, having loads of different ideas and figuring out how to create those in code and, and make artworks from them. Um, and then in the last few months, I feel that I have begun to understand what I want to do as an artist and where I'm going as an artist. And so I'm developing work, um, creating a library of techniques and textures um, so that I'm building on previous work. And so people are getting a feel for who I am, which makes me more collectible um, and makes me more able to have a following. So <sighs> gradually, hopefully, um, you know, we're getting to a position where um, I can quite confidently make work that I know I'm going to sell. You know, there were times in the past where I would spend weeks creating something, as I'm sure, you know, every, every, not every, most new generative artists have the experience of working extremely hard, um, putting hours and hours and days and weeks into a piece and then putting it out for sale and nobody buys it, um, which can be really disheartening. Um, but I, I, I'm hoping that that's not going to happen to me too much anymore because I, I understand the market and I understand myself and myself as an artist better. Okay, perfect. We, we are going to, to uh, get back to that on uh, what did you understand about the market and uh, basically everything that you say. I want to get back a little bit about, um, I want to talk a little bit, a little bit about your background. Where um, Have you been a, an artist... Uh, since uh, since when? When uh, basically, just to talk a little bit about your background, just to to have kind of um, how, how, far, how far back would you like me to go? Um, oh, okay. um, you know, big uh, where you are comfortable to to go, basically. Well, so my first experience of generative art was when I was nine years old. Now I'm 56 now, so this was in 1975, uh, when most people didn't have home computers. Um, but my father worked for a company called ACT, which later became Apricot. Um, so he was right at the forefront of developing um, PCs in, in this country. And um, we had a, a home PC. I think it probably had about two kilobytes of memory, um, but we had it. And um, I, at nine years old, I, I learned basic programming. Um, and I remember creating, you know, when you create a line, I mean, it's still done today where you create a line to a point and then lots of lines. I can't think what it's called. Okay. Um, yeah. And I, I wrote programs that did that. So that was when I was a child. Um, and then I, I lived. Um, I trained as a teacher, a uh, maths teacher, when I was in my 20s um, and worked as a teacher for many years. Um, but I've always, always had always wanted to, to bring together maths and art. They're my two loves, mathematics and art. Um, and in 2011, I decided to leave teaching to become a font designer. So that's what I did because there I could use maths um, to create letter forms and shapes. 
Um, and what I found myself doing was actually writing open type code and making complicated fonts because I, I enjoy the coding as well. Uh, and then, so I did that for a while. And then in December, I met a friend, met up with a friend who is um, a little bit well known on, on FX Hash. Um, and he told me about what he was doing and showed me his work. And I thought, wow, uh, and he's making he's he's making a lot more money than I probably ever will. But um, what I thought was, well, I can do that, you know. And um, I asked him what I needed to learn to be able to do that. And he suggested I learn P5 JavaScript. Um, so I went away and started learning. And you, you did you know any other uh, lang language uh, of programmation before? So I learned basic as a child. I learned logo at university. I learned HTML. Um, so I'd done some website building just to you know, make a bit of money on the, uh, And then I'd done the coding with my fonts. Um, but I'd never done any JavaScript. I didn't like the, the I didn't. I didn't think I would find JavaScript easy to learn. It seemed like a strange language. Um, but actually, once I started learning it, I realized it's very, very similar to basic that I'd learned as a child. And um, I think I've picked it up fairly quickly. Yeah. Okay. And so did, did that bring you some um, child memories? Very much so, yeah. Very much? Oh, yes, mostly just a feeling of frustration that I was kind of born too early to... Be, you know, be a young person in this market, which would be really exciting. Um, and yeah, I wish that I'd carried on with what I was doing then because I've always, always, you know, it, for me, it doesn't feel like work. Um, yeah. You know, I'm somebody who I'm, I'm on the autistic spectrum. I really like techno technology that distracts me. So I would spend a lot of time playing computer games, for example. Um, but once I started doing the, the coding, the art coding, I was finding that I would rather do that than anything else. So I get up in the morning really happy, really excited, looking forward to, to the work. And it doesn't feel like work. It feels like indulgent escapism, um, just you know, joy, joyful for me. Um, yes. Okay, perfect. So basically you, you meet um, your, your friend, uh, your friend, Give you basically the the setup to start. Basically, you have to learn this uh, language. Uh, maybe um, be present on this uh, platform, etc. What what are the other uh, advice that uh, your friend uh, gave you? Except uh, learn this uh, language. Well, we sat together and looked at the FX Hash website, um, and looked at the the work that was being produced. Um, and he showed me what he considered to be the better examples of that work and the worst examples of that work. I mean, there's some really terrible work on FX Hash as well as some really wonderful work, which is one of the joys of that platform. Um, he told me to, right from the beginning, uh, learn to make work which adapted to window sizes, which at the time I didn't really understand the importance of that. But so... Uh, he told me, yeah, to make work that would adapt to window sizes. He told me to do all of my randomization at the start of the pro. Oh, stuff that I didn't really understand about randomization um, and how to work that into the programs. Um, he told me it was quite. We had quite an interesting conversation. He said the way to do it is to look at the work that you like look at who's buying that work and look at the other work that they're collecting and then try to create work that is similar to that. Mm, uh, okay. Yeah. So that was his advice. But I then said to him, I said, well, is, is that what you do? And he said, oh, no, no, I don't do that. Um, because what he does is he creates original work from his heart that he wants to create, you know. Um, so I said, well, I don't think I'm going to do that either. And I haven't done that. Um, and I think that's that the market is moving and changing so fast. It's so vibrant that trends come in. So 
So somebody will create something beautiful and then you will see over the next few weeks, lots and lots more pieces using those same techniques, using that same aesthetic. Um, and then people don't want it anymore. People are bored of that and they want something new. So what I have tried to done is to create things that are different from what is actually being sold, which isn't necessarily the easiest way to get um, to become popular, but it, it's what I've done. Um, and I, with the textile um, pieces that I've been doing, I don't know if you've seen my work at all, but with the textile pieces I've been doing, they really are quite, nobody else is doing that in the same way to the same kind of level. Um, what so is what is sorry to to cut you off? Uh, what is um, um, unique on your uh, aesthetic? Okay, so um, I created a kind of photorealistic fabric um, for one of my pieces. Um, the first piece, it, it was actually just as a background for something that I was doing. But I really enjoyed doing it. And lots of people said, wow, we love that fabric. We love that texture. So I then created more textures and more textiles. And I did pattern textiles and woven textiles um, and put those together to make a piece which, which I called patched because um, it was like a patchwork embroidery um, piece of work. And it was very successful. It was the first piece that, Um, it sold out and then it did well on the secondary market. And I had a couple of high sales, well, for me, high sales of like 35 tears, um, which at the time was about 100 pounds. Um, so it was really successful. Um, but then I went off that and did all sorts of other things because I was still new and still full of ideas for what I wanted to do. But none of my other pieces were as successful as that one. So then a few months ago, I returned to that textile work and I've been developing that. And I think I'm reasonable in saying that on FX Hash, at least, I don't know about other platforms, there's nobody else who is doing realistic textures in, in the same way that, that I'm doing at the moment. Okay. So uh, are you talking about uh, wipe? The, um, the, the collection wipe? Why? No. No, it's not. Uh, it's not uh, this That's one. Not mine. That's not mine. Uh, I believe so. Okay, let me. Um, if I can do that. Um, yeah. It's not a. Uh, it's not your uh, colleague. It's not your um, page on a uh, office uh, hatch. That's my page. Yes. So all of those, all of those on the top row there, those are all textile pieces that I've done recently. Yes. Okay. Okay. I thought that you you were talking about uh, wipe. I don't know what you mean by wipe. No, it's a uh, you know it's what I was talking about. It's my uh, accent, maybe. It's uh, I'm talking about um, uh, that. Oh, this one. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, no, that one that one didn't do very well, really. Um, I ended up giving that one away. So sorry. So I uh, so basically I didn't um, uh, uh, understand um, uh, well what you were. Um, Uh, saying because basically what I have uh, understood uh, was um, you were doing uh, overlaying with uh, text. Yes. Oh no, I'm talking about textiles. So tech, so fabrics. Okay. Um, I think we're. I think we. Yeah, we're misunderstanding each other here. Yes. Yes. No. 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 It's. Uh, it's. Uh, yeah. uh, it's uh, on my side. So you basically everything that you are referring to, it's on the first uh, row. Um. The. The ones that I'm talking. Yes. The ones that I'm talking about now. The the aesthetic that I'm developing now. That is the the top row. Um, okay. You can see there. Yes. Okay. Um, and then, so, uh, yeah. I mean, if you. 
obviously if you look down then you'll see there's loads of different sorts of things that are completely different from one another um there's some yeah some that are animations some that are using shaders um some that are very much about user interaction so there's all these different sorts of pieces and they all look very different they don't look like they necessarily come from the same artist um but um now it, it it feels like and i said to people at the time it was like i was doing a foundation year i don't know if you know that concept so when artists you know before artists go to study their chosen field they do a foundation year where they experience all sorts of different kinds of art and mark making so i think my first six months of of, of work was really like a foundation i was just watching videos trying out techniques creating artwork from them um but now i'm developing from one piece to the next i'm developing in in a particular direction that i'm excited about and i'm enjoying so my last piece was zen strokes which was uh, a canvas piece which then had a, a swirl of paint on it um which was very hard for me to be so minimalist because usually I just keep throwing more and more things at something thinking that I need to give people a lot for their money you know um, but with this one I just loved it so much when it was so simple and, and I, I share all of my work um, I share on the FX hash discord channel um, there's a feedback and critique channel and everything that I do I share there and I wish more people would use it because it's so helpful because people, there's, there's several people there who are experienced artists and they will give suggestions. Um, they're not all, I don't, don't take up every suggestion, but very often I've had really helpful suggestions. Anyway, so a lot of people on there said, this is fine as it is, so I, so I published that as it is. Um, and my piece that I'm working on now is a development from that where I'm doing a lot more paint on canvas. So it, it looks like reasonably realistic paint on canvas. Um, and yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a lovely way of working. And I'm hoping that people who like my work already will like this, this next piece because it's of the same sort of um, aesthetic. Yes. Okay. Makes uh, makes sense. When you when you share your uh, work on the um, FX uh, Ash uh, Discord, um, did you share it uh, before you put it uh, on chain? Oh yes, always. I mean, once I have something that looks a bit like what I what the final piece will be, then I will share some pieces. Um, I think that. One of the things that I've noticed, especially with new artists, is that when I spend a lot of time working on something and looking at it for hours and hours every day, then I love it. Um, I come to love it because I created it and it's a part, of, it's an extension of me to an extent. Um, and I can't see, I can't look at it objectively. Uh, so if I put it on the feedback channel on Discord, then people will be honest with me and they'll tell me, you know, this is, we don't like this or this doesn't look right, this is wrong, I, this makes me feel uncomfortable. Um, and it's very hard to hear that because that's not what I want. I want to put it on there and everybody to say, oh, wow, this is the most beautiful thing we've ever seen. Um, but when I do hear it and I listen to that and I take on that criticism, then I can improve the work. And um, and it, it yeah it, it's uh, it, it brings me down to earth and makes me more realistic makes me more realistic about what I can charge for pieces as well because I, I feel as if and I, I've seen this happen with a lot of people is they will put up their, their first work or the early work and want to charge a lot of money for it because they know how much they put into it but that isn't unfortunately that isn't what that piece is worth. Mm -hmm. um, So we ha I have to be realistic and ask other people what they think it's actually worth on the market. Um, and then I have the experience of selling rather than the experience of pricing something too high and not selling it. 
Okay. So basically, you ask, um, what do you think about this aesthetic? And also, what do you think will be the, the good uh, price range? Yeah. Okay. And I don't always ask that these days, but I, I certainly did in the beginning. I, I asked that price. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Get it. Um, regarding the aesthetic, um, when you when you build when you are building your uh, algorithm, your algorithm will generate an amount of uh, iteration. How do you pick um, the the selection that you want to showcase to to people? for feedback collection? Um, I would pick ones that are, mm, I think what I actually do is I pick the ones that I think are the best, better ones, um, but also try to show people the range. Um, and that's another question often is, you know, asking people if some pieces are too different from the others you know is the variation okay do these all look like they belong to the same collection or you know um and generally the more variation the better but also if if some sometimes you know certain parameters in the algorithm won't produce something so so beautiful and my personal choice with that is to make those very rare so that if somebody gets one of those, then it's rare. Um, or just, yeah, sometimes you just have to say, no, I'm not going to allow that to, to be part of the collection because it's not fair. There's nothing worse than, I, I do mint things as well myself. I do collect myself, although not very much. There's nothing worse than feeling disappointed when you, when you mint a token. And what you get isn't what you were expecting because it's very different from from the other pieces. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, it makes a, a lot of sense. And but basically, it's um, a question that I have. It's are you a uh, generative artist? Are you um, um, dealing with uh, variation, with a kind of um, a general uh, quality? You know, because variation mm -hmm. can lead to having, uh, as you said, something uh, like a, a grail piece and uh, something that can be uh, seen uh, as a, uh, not mm -hmm. that good. You know, so how do you balance the variation, mm -hmm. um, general quality about mm -hmm. uh, variation? I, I think that is possibly the right at the essence of, of what good generative art is all about. And it's very difficult, uh, is the answer. Um, my early pieces were quite controlled. Um, you know, I, I knew what I wanted the, the piece to look like, and I made a piece that looked like that, and then I added a bit of variation, but the variation was really just in the scale and the color um, and, and little else. And a lot of my journey and my development as an artist has been about creating pieces which have a natural variation built into them. Um, and, and that continues. I generally, I, I'm quite controlling. If you, if you look at my work, it, it's not like as, you know, a lot of people's work is, um, is very random and I tend to control a bit too much. It's something that I have, I have difficulty with letting go of the work and allowing it to, to, um, so, um, so that's something that I am developing. So if you look at, for example, my, my piece patched with tartan, it's very much like you get a design and the piece is designed and it will, yes, you may get a bigger or a smaller flower. You might get a, a circle here or a square there, but generally, none of the pieces are going to be surprising. And then a piece like Borrow, which is uh, much more random with just pieces patching everywhere, which was m more popular and, and is more exciting, I think, for people buying the work. Um, and yeah, so I think what I try to do is make the most common pieces will be the ones that I know are, I know are good. 
Um, and then the outlying variations that may or may not work so well, um, I make those rare, as I said before, to to make them, to compensate the buyer. If they don't actually like them, at least they've got a piece that's rare. Um, and, and also, you know, I've been really surprised at what p other people like. As an artist, I create work that I like. That is my um my standard is is what i personally find beautiful um but i'm also aware that other people will find different things beautiful but i don't try to create things for other people because that doesn't satisfy me as an artist um i think that's a really sad thing that happens to artists uh, if they're trying to make what other people like rather than what they like themselves. So I, I continue to, to make what I, what I love. Um, and, I, and that's the joy of, you know, NFTs is that we have a big enough audience um, now for our art that if I love it, then I'm going to find enough people who also love it and who are going to come on the journey with me. Um, whereas in the past, when art was only sold to people who were like physically nearby to us, then it was much more difficult to find people who have the same um, vision, the same pleasures, the same, do you see what I mean? The same appreciation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, okay. But previously, you, you, you talk about your friends that uh, give you some uh, uh, guideline, and you, 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 you say that. Um, he gave you good example and bad example on a uh, FX uh, ash uh, without uh, pointing your your finger in um, anyone. How would you describe some things that is um, a, a bad work and uh, some things that is a good work? Okay. Um, so the most obvious things with it, with a, with what is not a not a good work is a work that changes proportions completely when you open it on the on a wide screen so you have a you know um so it doesn't resize properly um you have pieces that change um hmm, yeah where the preview image doesn't match the the output um things like that um bad work well i think that if 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 I can look at a piece and I know exactly how it was done immediately, then that isn't necessarily interesting. Mm. Um, and people new to creating things often will create work that is very simple geometric shapes um, and and colors. And personally, I I. I'm a great lover of colour and colour palettes. And I really, it's my favourite part of making a piece is um, creating the colour palettes for it. And I think some of the colour palettes, and it, it is a matter of taste, um, but I find some of the colour palettes really unpleasant and jarring. Um, I am an artist who I like things to be beautiful. I like things to be harmonious. And I know that that isn't what art is necessarily about for everybody. Um, but it is for me, and that's that's my personal personal opinion. Yes. Okay. Also, um, there's a, a lot of people will create very loud animations, you know, that are very, you know, flashing and fast moving and really hard to look at. Um, personally, I'm not a fan of those either. But that's my personal personal take, and um, luckily, everybody's different. Okay, perfect. I'm, I'm um, going to follow up on um, what you just said. When you watch something and you can explain how it has been done, mm -hmm. that means that it's not good because it's too uh, simple, right? I, I mean, that's quite... I'm sure there are lots of exceptions to that. But in general, yes. Um, 
yeah. Okay. And uh, so let's talk about the exception. Did you, have you any uh, uh, memories about thinking that something was done one way, you know, and talking with the actual artist that done the, the piece, you find out that he, he took something very, um, very, um, uh, what, is a, what is the word? Um, a creative, a creative way, basically a, a side way to, uh, to, to achieve it. And you, you were uh, surprised. I can't, I can't immediately think of an example of that. Um, I have had the experience of, do you, you know the difference between image composition and generative work? No. So Im image composition um, is when people are, uh, just created images and then they just layer them so that layered pngs okay um yeah so and at the moment about half of the work on fx hash is image composition and about half of it is generative um and it, it used to be so that you didn't know which was which and that was quite a problem because you'd see something that is an image composition piece. So somebody's created it in, in Illustrator or Photoshop and, and then they've just layered it with the programming rather than everything being generated by code. And um, I've seen pieces which I thought were coded and was very impressed by and then find out that they're image composition pieces. Um, so they now have they now label all pieces whether they're image composition or generated because people were, were, were creating these image composition pieces and people were buying them and being disappointed. Um, personally, I, I think FX hash should separate, have separate channels because then you know when you're looking at a piece, you know whether it's been made by code or whether it's been layered. Um, Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, looking through the marketplace on FX Hash, um, it can be quite baffling as to why some pieces are so popular and some pieces aren't. I see extremely beautiful work that doesn't sell. And I see work that, to me, is, isn't is interesting, that, that sells very well. And... Um, a lot of people will try to say why this is, but actually nobody really knows. There's all sorts of different factors that go into whether a piece is successful or not. Okay. And basically, how, how, how can someone check if uh, what is looking, it's a, a gen art or a image or composition? Well, on FX Hash now, everything that's image composition has to be labeled. So when you look at the description, it says that it's image composition. That's because of problems in the past. Yeah. Okay. And th there was nothing, um, if we don't talk about uh, the, the marketplace, um, you, you cannot point out on, on, the, on, the, on the source code? On the what? On the uh, algorithm. I don't know what you mean. But so, you know, the gen heart, you know, you have to make a, a piece of code and the piece of code, you know, um, when a collector is going to mint, the, the mint is going to be an input to the code to generate a piece. Mm -hmm. So that it's a gen art. Image composition, it's like a, a, um, um, a lot of layer of uh, different uh, things. So what I'm asking to you, it's without talking about the marketplace, there is... Um, uh, on, on the collector side, there, there is no way to find out to find out if there is some code or uh, if uh, there is no no code. Um. Well, I mean, I'm not an expert, but I, I mean, there is there is code. There's the code that creates the layers that chooses which layers to use. Um. Yeah, I think if you if you looked at the code, then you would be able to see that the, that the code was loading a lot of um, PNGs and then layering those. So you would be able to see that if you knew what you were 
you were looking for. Um, but I mean, it, the, the work is still generated in that it's the code that chooses how to layer, how to place the layers. Um, and most of the most pieces are, are bundled. Uh, my work is actually open. Um, the code is open, so you can, if you look at any of my work in live view, you can read all of the code. It's just there and easily to read. But most work is bundled, so that it's very difficult to to read. I don't really understand that that side okay. of things. Um, mine's just very open. Okay, and. Um... Um, do you put your code on chain as well? Yes. Okay. I'm not sure how I'm not sure how all that works, but no, I don't think the code is on the chain, is it? Um, I'm sorry, you need to talk to somebody who understands these things better. I don't know how that works. <laughs> no, no, no problem. It's, um... Because my I know that I, I mean I'm, my code tends to be really long because it tends to be quite a lot of it. Um, Although it's still a lot smaller than the image comp pieces because they've got all the the massive file sizes for the images. Um, no, I think all the code is stored somewhere else very safely. Um, okay. But yeah. Okay, perfect. Get it. So basically, I just asked you the question because my understanding it's um, gen art. It's very uh, special because it's the form of art that have a, a great fit with uh, blockchain technology because as everything is on chain, you know, you are kind of um, uh, protected by the blockchain itself. You know, that means that it's it's committed on, on it and, um, you know, uh, whatever happened to an edition, you can um, 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 how to say it, to uh, we wonder a uh, specific uh, edition, you know, later on. I um, I wouldn't like to say any more because my knowledge is I can make I can guess, but I I, I don't have to have the actual knowledge um, to tell you how that works. I think I don't know. Okay, don't know. no, I mean, no problem, no problem. The, the FX hash, I know that that there's an actual hash which is a, a forty nine digit code which when put into my code generates a specific artwork and it always generates that artwork and that hash is stored on the blockchain but i'm not sure about the actual code itself okay okay perfect perfect let's uh, let's um, talk a little bit about what you understood about the, the market so it was at the very beginning of of the of the interview you said um uh Okay, I just have a real-time question. So I will first ask you the question. What did you understand about the market? Nothing at all. Not a thing. I didn't know what an NFT was. I didn't. My brother had tried to explain what a blockchain was, but I didn't understand it. Um, I just looked, just looked at FX Hash, and I just looked through. And my first work, I think, I put up for sale for three tears, and it sold about fourteen. And at the time, I was really disappointed because in my head, I have got, OK, I'm putting up, I think, I don't know, 256 editions for three tears. That means I'm going to get a whatever, 700 and something tears back. And that will be enough for me to buy a new laptop. You know, that's that was my plan. And of course, I put it up and I sold 14 or 15 and I was very disappointed. Um, but actually, that was quite good, and I, I can say now, for a first work to sell to sell that many at three tests was 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 good. But um, I, 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 yeah, I've, I've learned slowly over time um, how how it works. Okay, perfect. So I have a, a question. So it's uh, just uh, JPEG. Hello, uh, hello. Uh... Because I, I know um, just uh, JPEG. So the question is, what's, what's the, the best uh, coding um, uh, bootcamp? So I, I, know have, you have, uh, I have no idea. <laughs> no know. idea. No idea. So no. me neither. So, um... I, I, I learned coding from, I mean, I use the P5.js um, online editor and the P5.js reference library. And I watched lots of YouTube videos. Um, and that's how I, I learned to code. Okay. But in, in your case, you already had a, a background, right? Because you, you already know uh, basics. 
So it's mm. kind of you didn't start from uh, from scratch because uh, I here. Yeah, I didn't start completely from scratch, but the or because I had a feel for how code works, but I didn't know a, a line of JavaScript when I first started. Um, and, and it is different, although it's very similar. The principles are the same. It, it, it is different. Um, I'm also lucky enough that my son's father, my ex-partner, is quite good at JavaScript. And although um, we hardly ever talk, we actually, um, I, I was able to call him and get help from him as well um, when when things were really difficult. And and there's also discord channels um there's a p5.js discord channel for fx hash there's a creator support channel um and there's some really wonderful people on there as well who will if you send them your code they'll look at it they'll debug it they'll tell you what you're doing wrong they'll help you you know and, and i did that quite a lot as well i still do do that quite a lot as well um so yeah, the help is there. The, the Discord channel for FX Hash is absolutely wonderful. Um, okay. If you if you use it for the different the different ways that it's useful. Okay, perfect. So he, he just uh, reply. Um, I have heard of uh, P five as well. Thanks. So mm. it seems that you give a give a a good good reply to uh, to him. Um, my next question is about your uh, eyes of. Um, what it's uh, happening on the market. What do you think it's um, missing or I don't know if you, uh, I believe you, you collect a, a few, uh, a few pieces, but as a collector, what, um, what would you want to, to see more on the gen art uh, market? If that Ooh. makes sense. It does make sense, um, but it's not something I've, thought about um hmm. i don't know i don't know because I, what i'd like to see more of i guess is is people's individual voices people um i think for me this is very new and for everybody it's quite new and what I'm finding exciting is that it's like there's a process where people start making art and they either enjoy it or they don't. They either are successful or they aren't. And then people fall away and then people stay and get better and better and better. And I'm seeing that particularly with some of my friends in the feedback channel. Um, the work that people are producing is just get every, one piece is better than the next, better than the next, better than the next. And I think that that is really exciting. And people are also becoming more individual. There's some beautiful photorealistic landscape work that is happening now. Um, and I'm not an art historian, but I think it, it, it's like you can almost see that same progression um, that you can see reflected in, in the, the art world of the different channels and the different kinds of, of work. Um, the, the work I'm currently doing is paint on canvas and I'm inspired by the work of a, a, a painter called Sean Scully. Um, and I am recreating actually very similar to his actual work, uh, which I think it's going to be very beautiful. I think the variation is going to be wonderful. I'm really enjoying the coding because um, there's, what's it called when you, you sort of have like a tree where, you know, where it's like you say you either go this way or this way. And then at that point, you either go that way or that yes. way. And, and, and this one, is, yeah. I, it's not a fractal? Yeah, like a fractal uh, decision tree where, so to, for the variations that you were talking about earlier, um, there will be so many variations having, you know, so once the, the code has gone through this process, um, yeah, I'm really excited. And that's, yeah, sorry, that's something that I want to see is more pieces where when you mint something, you don't know what you're going to get. You can look at all the other pieces, 
Um, but you don't know what you're going to get. It's going to be a surprise because they're all different in some way. Now, some of my work is absolutely not like that. My last piece, then Strokes, you pretty much knew you were going to get a canvas with a, with a, with a circle on it. And people were happy. That, that's one way of doing it. People were happy with that. They knew what they were going to get. They were going to get one of those. Um, but then look at some other pieces. And I can't think of any names. Um, but there have been some incredible pieces where the variation is amazing. And they're all beautiful, but they're all very different. Um, usually those are ones that I can't afford to buy. Um, but those are, you know, nailing that balance between variation and aesthetic is 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 like the the the, the holy grail of generative art for me um which is what i'm trying to do all the time um, okay perfect yes okay it's um it's um it's very clear and basically we already talked about that the difficulty to um uh being a, a good gen art it's uh being able to handle the variation and uh, the quality, you know, on the aesthetic. So um, it's um, a repetition of uh, what you already uh, explained mm -hmm. on, on the podcast. Uh, let's talk a little bit about um, your collectors. So do, do you know them? Do you do you interact with them a little bit on a, on a Twitter? Do you know why uh, your collector um, uh, choose... Uh, Yeah. Uh, one piece uh, and not uh, another. Um, well, I don't. I don't know that I necessarily have very many collectors. I have a few, um, and some of those are people who I know, who I talk to on Discord, um, as well as on Twitter. Um, I always do try to reply to people who show examples of my work uh, that they have bought, um, and that is something that I think is. I, I'm, I'm just on the edge of, I'm just beginning to get into to that. Um, like, so my, like my last piece, I had about four or five reserves because people had asked for one to be reserved. And some of those were people that I didn't know prior to that. Um, so that's really nice. And um, I didn't have a Twitter account at all before I started doing this work. So I've built that up from, from nothing. And I'm, I'm not... I'm not very good at being dedicated to spending time on Twitter every day. Um, it's one of those things that I feel I should do more. Um, but I, yeah, I think people like my fabrics for sure. This, this piece that I'm doing at the moment was supposed to be a fabric piece. It was supposed to be a, a canvas with paint on it. But because I've been inspired by this guy, Sean Skelly, he covers the, the canvas completely with paint. So the only bit of canvas, the only bit of textile is just around the edges. So I'm, I'm hoping it will still be attractive to people who like the textile work. Um, but my next piece will, well, I don't know. Probably, I don't know. Um, okay. I th I'm, thinking, I'm thinking of doing um, kind of African mud printing, which is... Yeah, it's really it's exciting, but it might be too difficult for me. Um, but that would be a fa that would be more fabrics, but with some really vibrant, beautiful patterns on them. Yeah. And I think people will like it. Hopefully. Okay. What uh, what, what um, so far? What, what is your biggest uh, mistake? Ooh. Hmm. Um. I think my biggest mistake was when pieces didn't sell, I reduced the price to zero to sell them so that people would just take them. And I wouldn't do that again. Um, I would rather just burn, burn the, the editions that haven't sold or just leave them there. I think I was embarrassed, I, you know, It's quite, um, you know, one makes oneself quite vulnerable putting up a piece of art for sale and it feels like you're very exposed. And if I put something up that I've put my heart and soul into for a month and then it doesn't sell, there's a kind of feeling of a shame. Um, and so I've wanted to just reduce the price to zero so that it, so that it will go. 
Um, and I'm oh, sorry, my cat is. Um, no problem. He'll hopefully he'll shut up soon. Um, but but as somebody actually wrote to me and said that that this devalues the work for people who bought it, and I appreciate that that if somebody has bought it and spent money on it, and I then say, okay, well, you're giving the rest of these away, that isn't that isn't a good thing, and I wouldn't do that again. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that. So some um, I'm going to showcase some uh, live comment. So Crystal, I. Uh, air to support and um, Georgie Peg uh, again, you are a beast. So it seems that um, what you are sharing, it's uh, very appealing to, to, to him. Um, so I have a couple few questions because uh, we are um, close to the, to the end of, of, the, of the podcast. I will ask you um, if you have a time machine would you change anything? And if if yes, what would you change? Hmm. I have I have thought that um, I would like to have I, I don't know if I could start over with my FX hash profile at this point. I would love to be able to do that because I think. I could charge more for the work that I'm doing now than I than I am doing. It's like because like all of the bots and people look at okay this person their last work sold for so much so therefore this is how much their work is worth. And I think the work I'm doing now is worth more but I can't charge more because the history and you know the the marketplace on my other pieces is such that um it's it's not worth more you know i see people coming in new people who've got background in coding you know, artistic talented people and they create work and they sell it for higher prices than, than i do and i think some of that work not all of it a, all of it is, is a lot better than the stuff that i'm doing but some of that work is not um but they're getting more for it and that can be a little bit frustrating um however um this is my journey and it, and it's fine actually um and it's it's going in the right direction, so I am happy. Perfect, perfect. And um, did um, did um, you wanted to address one particular subject, and I uh, didn't uh, offer you the opportunity? No, I think everything that was on my mind has come up. Perfect, mm -hmm. perfect. So I have only two last thing to 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 uh, to see with you. So the first one it's called uh, in French past decisive. So it's a decisive pass in English. And basically, it's when I'm asking to my uh, guest, who, uh, which other guest would you want to, to see on um, the podcast? And uh, which question would you, would you want uh, me to uh, ask them? Oh, that's put me on the spot a bit. Um... <laughs> if you are not comfortable, it's OK. It's, uh... I have a friend called Anne Bello. Um, who um, I think his um, Twitter account is at Waterflowing, um, and he's creating some glorious photorealistic um, work. And I would just love to hear about his inspirations for his work. Okay. And, and his journey with with um, I think he he uses three JS, which is um, also JavaScript, but it's aimed more for three dimensional work. Um, so I'd love to hear more about his process. Perfect. Perfect. And last question for me: It's uh, Kusamae. What is an NFT for you? What is an NFT for me? It's um, Oh, it's a really exciting way of making an explosion in art that is affecting the whole world, or it feels like it from my perspective. Um, it's freedom for artists to be themselves and still be successful. Perfect. Perfect. So thank you. Thank you very much for your time, for uh, everything that you share. Um, 
thanks uh, to Crystal and uh, Jazzy Peck to, to have been uh, um, watching uh, in uh, real time. Uh, thank you very much, um, Kusamae. In, um, let's uh, keep uh, talking on social. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Robert. It's thank been you. an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Bye.